and I'm interested to hear what we don't know about this, which is that so much viral research, I suppose, is either done in a dish with cell lines or in inbred mice or other genetically modifiable animals. But what about, I know you're interested in viruses and wild populations, so koalas being a wild population, but also just in perhaps wild mice or whatever. So what, what can we gain from looking at, what, what don't we know about viruses that we could know by looking in wild populations? Well, most of the viruses on Earth are in animals other than humans. And there are plenty out there, not just mammals, but insects and other things as well. So uh, the, the greatest viral load, as you used this term before, is in animals. And before, maybe 20 years ago, we really didn't appreciate this because we didn't have the technology to discover these viruses. Mm. And it turns out that you may know most of the viruses that cause serious human infections originate in animals, as far as we know, you know, the, the ones that uh, we know about today, Zika and Ebola and HIV, they all originated in animals. So did measles virus and smallpox virus. And, and does, do we have any idea why that is? Well, they were there before us on Earth, so the viruses were infecting them. Uh, and of course, at the same right. time, there were primates, prehumans, and so forth, and they got infected and they passed on their viruses to us. So the Earth as an ecosystem full of all sorts of animals, viruses infecting them, and when we come and we start to multiply and spread to different areas, we get infected we get with too. them as well. So studying these viruses is important because we may know, for example, what's in store for us, what's coming down the pike, mm -hmm. what's the next, next virus to infect us. Zika is a good example because this was a virus that was just in the forests of Africa for probably hundreds of thousands of years. We didn't know anything about it until it started infecting people. And I think that's going to happen on a regular basis more frequently as the population grows, travel, we incur on uh, ecosystems mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so forth. Well, that's a happy thought. Isn't okay. that, isn't yeah, that so that's why you should study uh, viruses. Unfortunately, most research on viruses is driven by the motive of understanding human disease. And that only gives you a small picture of what's really out there. There's far more. And in fact, I would argue that the vast majority of viruses are actually good. Right. So, I mean, there are plant viruses. Is that right? Everything. Every living thing has a virus. Has a virus. And so and, uh, you would argue that they're mostly good, meaning they do nice things or they, they, they do nothing? I think so. or they're... For example, everyone in this room is infected with probably at least a dozen viruses, you and I as well. Uh, maybe more, and most of them exist with us without causing any harm. And that's probably the same for every animal on Earth. They coexist with their own crop of viruses. Bats, for example, are a great example, and they have their own set of viruses that don't seem to make them sick. They can coexist with Ebola viruses and rabies viruses, mm. and, and they don't make them sick. So bat, bats are their natural hosts, and only when those viruses jump into humans do they cause problems. So the theory is that viruses are doing something beneficial uh, to us throughout our lives. There's very little evidence because you can't do experiments to test it in people. But in other systems, we're seeing evidence for good viruses. Can I give you an yeah, example? Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, there is a grass that grows around hot springs. So if you go to Yellowstone National Park, with the bubbling water, it's very hot. It's 50 to 60 degrees Celsius around there. And there are grasses that can grow right around it. The reason those grasses can grow is because they have in them a fungus, which is in turn infected with a virus. If you take this grass back to the lab and you take out the fungus and the virus, the grass will no longer grow at high temperatures. So that's an example of a beneficial virus. It's somehow benefiting the plant so that it can grow at a higher temperature. So that's remarkable because it's not just the virus, it's the fungus right. that hosts the virus that, I mean, it's like little Russian dolls somehow. Or that's right. It, right. And so I think these multi-symbiotic relationships are, are probably very common. We just haven't looked for them. So when we talk, I mean, it's very popular now to talk about the microbiome. That's a phrase that's okay around here. It's not too <laughs> jargony, you know, that... that that we carry this load of microbes in our gut and that they're actually quite important and things like that and that probably 